Our next speaker will be Marie-Claire Beaulieu from Tufts University, um, speaking on digital work, student research, and the tenure track. So uh, thank you all for coming and thanks Neil for organizing this panel. Um, as the most recent former assistant professor on this panel, I believe, uh, maybe not you, but anyway, I was asked to talk about my experience on the tenure track um, and uh, how DH affected uh, or influenced uh, my experience. And for me, it's been all about teaching, it's been all about uh, the students and, and what do we do that's, uh, that's new and different, how does that affect our profession? We're talking about the changing profession here today. And finally, how does that affect the curriculum? Um, and so uh, I will uh, hit all these aspects as we go along. So first, uh, in 2009, that's when my story began, I responded to a job advertisement, so it was a tenure track position at the level of assistant professor uh, at Tufts, teach Greek and Latin at all levels was the first uh, requirement. Uh, department seeks to a, a candidate who can advance the study of classics within the interdisciplinary context of Tufts University. And now that's interesting uh, because we all know that classics is naturally interdisciplinary, so it didn't scare me too much. Uh, and I was particularly interested in this last bit. We especially welcome candidates who can support contributions and original research by undergraduates as well as MA students within the field of classics. And now that's great. Uh, and I believe my other colleagues will address uh, some uh, of their initiatives in that respect. But the point is, uh, how does it change the field to integrate students to research? And, and how does that change our research? How does that make our research better? And how do digital tools uh, help us do that? So what kind of classics uh, does that uh, become? So there's a vision here for the discipline of classics at large. There's a vision for our students. What is it that we want students to get out of this experience? And finally, what was the vision for my own career? And, and what kind of career do practitioners of DH want to have? So for the discipline, we definitely want to democratize, right? So the implication of such a requirement is that not just the uh, minted and anointed professors can do research, but an undergrad can do research. And they can do it well, and they can make something that's useful for others. Uh, integrate with other fields, right, within the interdisciplinary context. I think that's a very important point. Also, we're naturally able uh, to connect with so many other disciplines, not just in the humanities, but elsewhere as well. So uh, I feel that we, uh, we're well positioned to have that vision. Uh, and for our students, well, we want them to have broad knowledge in classics that is immediately useful, right? We've all encountered this question from a student, why do I have to study Greek for five years before I can read uh, an actual text, right, that's unmodified and so forth? Uh, why does it take forever before they can say anything of value? Well, we can address that, uh, and I will show some ways uh, in which uh, that can be done. And for one's own career, well, it has to be uh, known that this will be collaborative work. It can't be done on your own. You have to work with engineers, you have to work with uh, other members of your field and other members of the humanities at large. So uh, the model of the lone scholar uh, becomes a little bit um, a little bit different in that uh, you become uh, a member of a team and then also outreach which I feel that classics is in an excellent position to do to tell people what it is we do and to make our knowledge and our research immediately useful and interesting for a broader uh, for a broader audience without compromising on the quality uh, and I know that's a big statement, but I will get back to this. 
So um, how do we describe our professional research, right? If we intend to have students participate in it, we need to know what it is we're trying to do. So rigorous standards, uh, I think that's self-explanatory, <laughs> needs to be reproducible. We're all about data uh, in whatever form we work. So experiments need to be reproducible. Peer review is an important point, which was addressed earlier. And uh, disseminated publicly, that's, uh, that's what a publication is all about. And finally, collaborative research. So student um, and the students will participate in doing such uh, research uh, by micro publications. And that's really one way to get around the problem of having to uh, study for years and years and years before you can say anything uh, of use is to uh, have students make micro assertions. So, so and so is tied to so and so. This word appears here and here and here, and here's what I have to say about that, etc. Right. So, small, uh, small contribution that are nonetheless rooted in uh, the primary sources and therefore reproducible, and also you can check their accuracy uh, very easily. It's all uh, put out in the form of machine actionable data and therefore uh, can be uh, aggregated into large co collection and participate into broader developments. And in this way, that lets students participate in the creation of knowledge, further development of the tools, and this is really important, right? As you do this, the tools that are being used get, um, get debugged and fur further uh, developed. And finally, uh, I will address that at the end of my talk, the development of new curricula, because you can change the way you teach one class, but that has a ripple effect, and eventually you're changing the whole curriculum. So uh, I have done uh, this work uh, within the Perseids project, which I co-direct with my colleague Bridget Almas, who's a software engineer. Uh, Perseids is a collaborative online editing environment. Uh, which is built from existing open source tools and services. Uh, shout out to our friend at CTS. A shout out to uh, the uh, papyri.info papyri project. Uh, we've taken our core uh, constituents uh, from them and various other, uh, of course, uh, tools and services. And so you can see our tools. You can find instructions and so forth uh, on the sites there. You can follow us on Twitter if you like. Uh, our core value is to put the data first, so produce reusable data, produce data that can be preserved uh, with stable identifiers and serialized according to standard open formats. Uh, so these are details on the, uh, on the platform and software, which I will not go into right now because that is not the topic of my talk, but I encourage you to look it up. So here are some of the things we've done uh, with the Perseids tool. So. Um, in my intermediary Greek class, we look at Greek inscriptions, which is really fun, and the students end up uh, learning a whole lot about Greek this way. And this is uh, a little tool uh, which was put together uh, to, uh, to grab words off of an image and transcribe a Greek inscription that way. And then you integrate it to an XML document that's on the bottom of this page. Uh, now students enjoy doing that. They learn uh, to encode according to Epidoc standards and so forth. But what do you do once you've done that? That's, that's fabulous, but okay. So once you've done that, you can do more. Uh, you can do a tree bank of that inscription. And a tree bank, as we all know, is morphosyntactic annotation, and that lets us comment on how does the sentence work grammatically. So I've got my main verb object, subject, and uh, attributes of that subject, and so forth, right? So this lets the students say, here's how uh, this inscription works grammatically. It's also lovely when you have missing words and so forth, because you can explain alternatives and why one alternative doesn't work and the other does and so forth, right? So that's a really important part of a textual edition. If you're going to edit an inscription, you might as well uh, explain how you understand its grammar. Similarly, uh, this is the same inscription. You can align its translation. Greg showed some of this earlier. So that is another part of a good edition, right? Explain how your translation aligns to the original Greek. Great. So now I've got an inscription that's rooted on its support. We can 
compare the transcription with the image, we can also see how the editor thinks the grammar works and see how the translator uh, is uh, routing their translation on the original text. Fabulous, but who's going to read that, right? Um, and I think that's where we do this, which I love. Um, so this is a page from Flickr. As you know, Flickr is a repository of pictures of every possible kind. Uh, and it turns out uh, that uh, my colleagues, Gabrielle Bodar and Josh Sosin, as well as various others, were mining Flickr for images of Greek inscriptions and uh, told me about their project. And so I started having students go on Flickr, find such images. Uh, and as you can see, um, give a link to uh, the Phi database so that they could uh, find the text. And this person is wondering what it says, and uh, the student is uh, helping out here in the community. Uh, some of my students also will put links to their, um, to their editions of the text on Perseids so the users have full access to, uh, to the scientific edition. So this is one way to contribute and to make our knowledge useful and available uh, without compromising, I feel, on the quality here. Uh, I don't think there's any compromise that's being made here. So um, this was for an intermediary Greek class. And now the question is, what do we do when we come out of Greek or Latin or whatever? Where we, what do I do with 100 freshmen? who don't know Greek or Latin and are not going to be classics majors, right? Uh, there's got to be things that they can do too because they love classics and they might as well be involved. So this is an experiment uh, that we started around 2012, I believe. Uh, so we started annotating, uh, so this was a mythology class, we started annotating Smith's Dictionary of uh, Greek and Roman Mythology. So the idea was to enhance such a dictionary, right? with information that you couldn't find otherwise, right? It's all in there, it's all in the primary sources that are cited, but how do you make that apparent? And how do you make uh, the classicist's knowledge here be of use to somebody who might be looking this up, right? So what we did was uh, to annotate, first of all, the figures in order to create a social network, right? So graphically, how do these figures interact with one another? So this is Penelope. And as you can see, we use the hypothesis web annotation tool. It's a very lightweight, uh, lightweight web annotation tool, which just gives you a little square in which you input your information. And we gave them a controlled vocabulary and tags where uh, they could uh, insert the information that would then be ingested and serialized. Uh, so that, th that is the uh, serialization according to the open annotation model. Now, obviously, no one is going to use that, but they might use this. So that's a visualization we created using uh, GabViz. Um, so you can see the original article there, and uh, we get a social network of that figure. This happens to be Scylla. So the question remains, what do I learn from this that I don't know from reading the article? What, uh, how have I enhanced the resource? So I see at a glance that Scylla is actually linked uh, with all monstrous figure. That's kind of nice. And also with uh, sea divinities, right? So I've learned something about Scylla at a glance by, by looking at this. What else can I learn? Well, I can, so that's the bigger, um, that's the bigger network. So you can see all the monsters in there, Geryon and so forth, Lamia, etc. Um, what else can I learn? And I, here I will thank uh, my colleague Greg Crane and Anna Crone. Um, so we can learn how the ancients talked about this, right? The article gives me all the uh, links to the primary sources. Well, we might as well look that up. And how did the ancients characterize these figures? And now uh, the question here is, we want to go and look it up in the text. We're classicists. That's what we do, right? But how do you have 100 freshmen do this if they don't know Latin and Greek? Well, they do this. Um, so they are introduced to the Greek and uh, Roman uh, alphabet. So that takes about, I don't know, a session. Um, and then they do basic vocabulary exercises and they use the Perseus tools to look up their passage, right? So 
uh, ancient Greek with facing English and look up where their figure is being described and characterized and find that word. So for instance, um, for instance, we've got Scylla here and we've got her um, characterized as rapax and rabiam and blabin and so forth, right? So these are all things that my students found. Um, and I think that's really interesting in the sense that this is a very traditional, good old word study, the way we do them uh, around here. Uh, but uh, this can be immediately useful to someone who doesn't know classics, right? And it also told the students a lot of things that they wouldn't have found uh, otherwise by writing a paper on this mythological figure. So this is how uh, we've enhanced here uh, the resource. And of course, uh, all this student work gets aggregated, so at the end of a semester, you're getting quite a bit of data. If you do it repeatedly, um, you end up with a nice chunk of stuff. Um, so this is the new generation. Uh, the hypothesis workflow became cumbersome after a while uh, because we were pushing hypothesis um, towards our own goals. So eventually we uh, designed Plokamos, uh, Frederick Baumgart, uh, did this and uh, it is a very lightweight annotation tool. So it's the same principle, same goals, uh, all of it. In this particular case, I've highlighted Acteon uh, to say that he's the son uh, of this uh, Aristeus. And so I am offered here choices from the controlled ontology uh, SNAP for relationships. And so the students are offered choices as they type and this has helped us control the quality of the annotations and control for basic typos and that kind of thing. Uh, the result is lovely and I can actually show it to you live, which is fabulous. Uh, this will be released on online. This is uh, something we're working with now. So this is a student annotation on Achilles. You can see that Achilles is here uh, in the middle. And we've got his relationships and we can actually filter so here's the relationship where people are son of. Um, what I find is very interesting with Achilles are his alliances. So he's allied, uh, as you can see, with Patroclus. There's Peleus here, his father. There's Ajax and Odysseus, uh, among others. Uh, and now you can look, let's look at his enemies. Ooh, so we get Hector and Thersites. Uh, that's kind of interesting, and those are things that at a glance can tell you a lot if you want to know about Achilles. Now, what about characterizations? Um, we've got Agamemnon here who's being called majestic and the master and famous. Uh, Achilles himself is being called a uh, lion-hearted and so forth. And if you click on one of these, um, it will uh, take you actually so when this is live, it takes you here, which is a Perseus URI, so you can find exactly what text where uh, this word was used uh, to describe Achilles. Uh, one thing that's great about Plokemos is that all this data is downloadable as a CSV or RDF, so uh, you can reuse them later for other, uh, other pursuits. Uh, how am I doing on time here? Okay. So, I promised I would talk about the curriculum. Let's talk about the curriculum. I gave you a handout about our new MA program in digital tools for pre-modern studies. So what do we want to do with these curricular advancements uh, is to give, uh, to give our students the, uh, the ability to be uh, designers of DH projects, not only consumers. And how do we do this? You can see uh, on the handout that the program has a very strong uh, humanities component, uh, among which a language component. Um, it also has uh, DH classes that are mandatory, the first of which I've taught as a pilot project uh, this uh, last semester. So uh, it's a joint class with computer science, so I teach jointly with a computer scientist and we've taught each lecture together uh, and we took the approach of learning by doing. So for each module, uh, we ask the question and we usually take uh, a hypothesis that's out there in the field and we test it, see if we can reproduce the results. So uh, this, was the, uh, this was a stats module. So some of the modules we've done was stats. We did 
uh, probability, we did um, modeling and prediction, uh, and so forth. Um, so this was a stats module, this was part of that. And here we compared uh, the data about vases that's found in Perseus versus uh, what you can glean out of the CVA, which is a big black box as we know. So uh, what did we get? Uh, we wanted to compare is the, is the Perseus vase data representative uh, as far as shapes go uh, versus CVA. So you can see that um, we did this workflow by using uh, NIME, which is a uh, graphical user interface, which allows you to do uh, computing without writing any specific programming language, because you would use a variety of programming languages to achieve this. So here you're using one tool uh, to do all of it. Uh, what, one thing I did like about NIME was that it lets you do just enough computing, just enough mathematics to show you where to go next. Uh, and I think that was a great uh, advantage of using this. And also we got some interesting results. We got to test hypotheses and so forth. So I thought that was uh, a great experiment. Now, and I will finish uh, on this. Uh, what do students say about this approach, right? Um, I think that's important. Well, they said this, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they said this too, so I thought that was great, um, right? So students thinking that they're doing something real. Um, I think that's, that's exactly the goal. And finally, they said this, which I loved. Um, we're doing good research, uh, but it's not daunting. And finally, they said this. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. Sure. Are there questions? questions? Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so we're, you know, trying to figure out what to do about pH and okay? just in general. So I'm working with this class. Mm -hmm. your last example. So those were undergraduates. Yes. So uh, they were uh, eight undergraduates, most of them in the first year. And then, so what's next for them in terms of using what you taught them? That's interesting. So we've got a few who are taking intro to computer science, so uh, they are going in that direction. Uh, we've got several who are actually going into classics, so that also uh, is a path. So uh, I think that that worked well in the sense that it oriented people towards something they might not have done otherwise. And do, are they going to use these tools? I mean, are there other curricular places where they use the tools that they learned in your class, I guess is what I'm thinking. And is that just with you, or have you tried to get colleagues and other departments to yeah, so um, the tools I showed earlier, uh, so the, uh, the tree banking and uh, um, editing tools and so forth are, are used quite widely at Tufts and elsewhere. Uh, so that's not just with me. Uh, this particular class uh, with CompSci was a pilot, so I'm hoping my colleagues follow suit uh, and, and do this, but uh, there, there are data, uh, data science classes and so forth around campus uh, in which they could use those skills for sure. Seeing that tree banking mm -hmm. uh, slide, I was reminded of traditional diagramming. Yes. Sentence diagramming. We, we learned a long time ago that that was cruel and unusual. <laughs> <laughs> How is it different, and are we just dressing up the old methods with new ones? How is this a, a more effective method? That, that's an interesting question, and I think uh, you're hitting a very important point that we're doing nothing really new, right? Some of the tools are new, sure, but the, the background of what we're trying to do is the same. It's philology as it's always been, right? Um, so the diagramming works really well. The students actually love it. Um, it does not let them escape. They, they do have to diagram every day and so forth, uh, but they actually enjoy it and, and um, they ask for tree banking in classes. So that seems to be fine. Yes? Do you mind if I no, go for it. <laughs> go for it. One of the things about um, diagramming also is that it's machine actionable. So mm -hmm. you can take that data and you can feed it into a machine learning algorithm, but then it can produce other kinds of tools with it. For example, you have, uh, you're doing it for epigraphy. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know whether you have any plans to take a sort of computational 
um, machine learning approach to eph epigraphical, um, I guess, disambiguation. You know, all the filling in of the blanks in epigraphy sure. that seems to be done by voodoo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, until you like meet experts who like explain why it's not voodoo, but then you're still you're like it was really convincing. Then I walked away and I was like, wait, no, it's not magic. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if there are any uh, computational like, do you have any hopes in that direction, or are you going to feed the data? Sure. Well, we, we encode everything in Epidoc, and uh, Sylvia will tell you, uh, we aggre aggregate everything we can uh, to other existing database, and our data is all open for anyone to, uh, to use and to aggregate into larger, uh, larger uh, epigraphical databases. So. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you.